As the sun began to rise over Peterborough at 5 a.m. on the 12th of August 2011, it seemed to be a morning just like any other. 29-year-old Vitalia Balatovicien ventured out into the dawn light, making her way to work, leaving behind her 10-year-old son sound asleep in bed. Her main priority was her son, and she's never ever gone a day where she hasn't contacted him by phone during the day. But that day was not like any other. It was the day Vitalia disappeared. There was just nothing. There was hardly any clues at all, and it really was like she had completely vanished without a trace. Essentially, Vitalia's footprint on life had just stopped. What began as a missing person investigation quickly descended into something altogether more sinister. Police began to understand that Vitalia had lived in fear for the last decade. I'm thinking something has happened to her, she's come to some harm. This was now a hunt for Vitalia. The search to find the missing mother was an epic quest spanning six months and covering thousands of miles. The key to unlocking the horror of what had happened to Vitalia would come from the most ingenious of places, taking detectives into the mind of her killer and allowing them to virtually sit by his side as he carried out a cold, calculated and terrifying crime. She'd clearly been taken, but we never ever gave up hope that we were going to find her alive. Peterborough is Cambridgeshire's largest city, situated on the River Neen. It's culturally diverse and has attracted a large Eastern European community due to the plentiful job opportunities. In May 2010, Vitalia Balatovicien, a 27-year-old Lithuanian, moved to Peterborough to find work. She lived a very quiet, unassuming life. She took work when she could get it, which was generally kind of unskilled work. So she didn't have a lot of income, so she did the best she could with what she had. And she was the epitome of, of hard work. She would work 12-hour days, five or six days a week. Vitalia's motivation for working so hard was back in Lithuania. She had an eight-year-old son she planned to bring to the UK once she was settled. I have to call my son. She was a very caring mother, she worshipped her son, and she was a very, very, very hard worker. She came to the UK to work to ensure that her son had the very best. Her main priority was her son. In July 2010, two months after moving to the UK, Vitalia brought her son to live with her in Peterborough. But he didn't travel alone. Her husband of 10 years, 45-year-old Romantas Balatovicius, also moved to Cambridgeshire. In her younger days, Vitalia was in hospital for a minor condition. So bad noise. And met Romantas Balatovicius, okay? who was working in the hospital doing repair work. And that blossomed very quickly into the two becoming very close, living together. And then a few years later, Vitali gave birth to a little boy. In July 2010, the trio were reunited in the UK and looked like any other family. But behind closed doors, the reality was much more sinister. He was a jealous character. He was always dominant right from the start. I think he dominated her all the way through the relationship. She was a prisoner in a marriage. He was a bully and more. made her life a living hell. Look at me! I'm so sorry. Sorry? Sorry? And that culminated in him assaulting her a number of times in Lithuania. Look at me! For 10 years, Vitalia had been subjected to a relentless and horrific torrent of physical and psychological abuse. She had come to the UK to finally escape her husband and build a new life with her son. But in July 2010, Romantas Balatovicius convinced Vitalia to give him one more chance, and she conceded. The family were reunited in Peterborough on the promise of a fresh start. That promise lasted just 24 hours. Very quickly, he reverted to time. He grabbed her around the throat 
and tried to strangle her. Don't bury you! And she, in a terrified state, called the police, and Romantis was arrested. Vitalia told the police that Romantis had wrongly accused her of having an affair. And how does he hurt you? He then repeatedly choked her, and while she struggled for breath, told her that he would bury her in the garden. The way the statement reads, you could almost feel her fear within the wording of the statement. And it clearly was. He was very, very nasty and very, very dangerous. Vitalia's abusive husband was released on bail, but whilst the police were awaiting a charging decision from the CPS, Romantas fled back to Lithuania to avoid prosecution. He then came back into the country weeks later and was picked up by police in Essex when they realised that his car and his name had triggered responses with the police national computer that he was actually wanted. But after the Crown Prosecution Service had considered all the circumstances in that assault, the proceedings were dropped. Romantis was a free man, but something had changed in Vitalia. On the 13th of September 2010, she divorced the violent bully. She eventually had enough and they split up. And I think she was then quite happy that he chose to go back to Lithuania and she stayed in Peterborough, where she could have restarted her life. But Vitalia would never truly be free of her obsessive ex. He would incessantly text her, and he had to come here and see her. In February 2011, his threats to return became a horrific reality. Morning. For the second time in six months, Romantas Belatovicius ferociously attacked his now ex-wife. Only this time, he did so in front of a host of witnesses. He grabbed around the throat, which was synonymous with the previous attack, and it was a vicious attack. The police are on their way. This is the drover. <laughs> Unfortunately, she escaped with, with minor injuries, but it was a, a timely reminder for Vitalia that she may be divorced from him, but his appetite to control her had by no means diminished by the fact that their marriage had ended. In July 2010, the case had been dropped, but this time the violent bully was charged with common assault. But Romantas Balatovicius skipped bail and fled to his native Lithuania. He's now wanted, having failed to turn up for bail, but he's also a wanted man that knows that if you come back into the UK, the chances are that you're going to be arrested. Although in exile and unable to physically harm Vitalia, it seemed she would never fully escape the shadow of her violent ex-husband. He was obsessed with her from a thousand miles away, and he would not leave her alone. 28-year-old Lithuanian Vitalia Balatovicien had suffered a decade of horrific abuse at the hands of her ex-husband Romantas. After Vitalia finally divorced him, and attempted to start a new life, Romantas unexpectedly appeared and attacked her when she was collecting her son from a friend's house. <laughs> Wanted for common assault against his ex-wife, Romantas fled the UK to his native Lithuania to escape prison. The fact that he had left the country again was some comfort to Vitalia, but she felt as if every corner she turned around, there was always the risk that she was gonna run into him. Vitalia was petrified that her ex-husband would come to the UK and harm her or her son, so she put into place strategies to try and protect them. As far as work was concerned, she always got picked up by a friend. It was her control measure to feel safer. Such was the fear that Romantis had, had instilled in her. Vitalia felt very vulnerable, and that close friend was very important because Vitalia shared with her the secrets of what went on in the marriage. I know where you are. I know when you leave. And even on one occasion, allowed her to hear how Romantis spoke to her on the mobile phone. I have to call my son. She would ring her son on her breaks and at lunchtime to make sure he was OK. What are you doing? She would never, ever break that routine because she needed to know that he was OK. Yeah, I'll see you soon. And that was born out of her fear yeah. that Romantis might try something. With Romantis in exile and unable to physically harm his ex-wife, Vitalia attempted a fresh start after a decade of pain and torture. 
she met a man who she developed a friendship with such that she started to be comfortable around him and, and called him her boyfriend. I think she was just starting to find her feet and just starting to blossom and starting to enjoy life again. Oh, thank you so much. But the one thing Vitalia held most dear was used as a weapon against her by Romantas. She found herself in that terrible dilemma of having gone through what she'd gone through, that there had to be a level of contact. Look what's come for you. <laughs> Romantas would shower their son with gifts from Lithuania. One such gift was a laptop. He would insist on contact with their son on Skype. But because Vitalia lived in the same room as their son, Romantis was then able to see what was going on in the background. He saw her with a new necklace, and he was very quizzical about where this necklace had come from and who'd give it to her. And was told that her boyfriend had bought it for her as a gift. And that seemed to resonate very deeply with Romantis. Romantas was wanted by the police for assaulting Vitalia and would be arrested if he entered the UK. But in July 2011, just after Vitalia received the necklace from her new boyfriend, someone matching her ex-husband's description was spotted in Peterborough. Vitalia was told by her friend that she saw somebody who she recognised as Romantis but had a beard that she hadn't seen on him before and she knew him reasonably well. Natalia went white, she was physically sick. That just says to me how scared of him she was. This would have been a nightmare for her. Traumatised by the sighting of the violent fugitive, Vitalia went to the police. Oh, I don't know what else to do. But there was no record of Romantas Balatovicius entering the UK. It appeared Vitalia's friend had been mistaken. For the next month, more so than ever, Vitalia was vigilant about ensuring she did everything she could to keep herself and her son safe. But on the 11th of August, something happened which threatened the measures she had painstakingly put into place. Vitalia would normally be picked up directly outside a house by a friend, but the car she was in nearly broke down. Later on that evening, her friend rang back to say, my car so is undrivable, but it was quite late in the evening, and that left Vitali with no chance to make alternative arrangements to get to work. She would have to walk into town. After Romantis's surprise attack in February 2011, Vitalia was so scared that she had avoided being anywhere in public alone. Now she faced the prospect of the two-mile solitary walk just after dawn into Peterborough. That following morning, Vitalia left the house at around 5 a.m. She got up much earlier than she would otherwise because she had the walk into the city. As the day progressed, the 29-year-old failed to follow her usual routine. Vitali was a creature of habit. Whenever she was at work on her breaks, she would always make contact with her son to check in with him and make sure he was OK. That day, Vitalia did not call to check on her son once. As it was the school holidays, the 10-year-old was being looked after by her housemates until she finished work. Any news? Vitalia should have been home by about six o'clock in the evening, but she didn't return home. Straight home away, her son became anxious. He called Vitalia's boyfriend. I, I, I'm on my way. And the pair of them came to Thorpewood Police Station in Peterborough to report Vitalia missing. We needed to establish, did Vitalia go missing before she arrived at work, or had she actually gone to work for the day and then gone missing on her way home from work, because that gave us a difference of eight-hour window. So we made inquiries with the agency, and she actually never arrived for work that day. Vitalia had not been in touch with anyone for over 12 hours. So at this point in the investigation, I'm thinking, one, she could have left on her own accord. She could have just decided that she'd had enough, wanted to leave or two, that actually something has happened to her, she's come to some harm. If Vitalia had left of her own accord, she couldn't have travelled very far. 
When Vidalia left for work that morning, she had with her a phone. I think she had quite a distinctive butterfly bag with her, but there was nothing else in there. There was no clothing. There was nothing that you would take with you as if you were intending to leave home. Therefore, by leaving everything else at home, including passports, she was expected to come home that day. Had she made an attempt to think, I've had enough, I want to go, she probably would have packed more things, but she didn't. And there was one clear reason why Vitalia would not just leave without a word. I mean, I've got boys, they're both the same age, and I thought as a mum, I wouldn't be leaving my children and I wouldn't have not made any sort of contact with them. Does she normally text you or ring you? The police interviewed Vitalia's son, her boyfriend, her housemates and her friends. I don't believe anybody thought that she was actually um, leaving home. I don't believe for a second that anybody thought that she was going on her own accord. If Vitalia had not left of her own accord, perhaps someone had forced her. Her ex-husband, he's crazy. And I think he's talking her. He tried to strangle her and threaten Because to of the problems that Vitalia had had with her ex-husband, they thought somewhere along the line that he was involved. He knows where she lives, he knows where she goes to work. Their troubled lives. history meant that Romantas Balatovicius was someone the police wanted to talk to. We felt that actually we should just phone him and ask him, have you seen her? Where are you? And when his phone was rung, we heard a foreign ringtone to his mobile phone. European data. Romantas was over a thousand miles away in Lithuania. And he was asked explicitly if he had seen Vitalia or knew of her whereabouts. And he was fairly emphatic that he couldn't possibly know where she was because he hadn't been to the UK since February. Although the obvious suspect, it appeared if Vitalia had been abducted, her ex-husband could not have done it. With Romantas in Lithuania and Vitalia missing, their son was all alone. Bless his heart, he was just the most adorable little boy. He just didn't know what was going on. I mean, the police were constantly in the house, was interviewing, asking him all these questions. As a duty of care to him, I felt that he needed to be properly looked after. So actually, I took out a police protection on um, the son, so I asked him to pack all his things, and he asked me very sweetly, he said, am I allowed to take my Lego? I said, yeah, of course you can. The 10-year-old was taken into foster care until Vitalia was found, but 36 hours had now passed since she was last seen. Nothing unusual. She was on her way to work, she does factory work in the Cambridgeshire area. There was just She's nothing. Not there was hardly any clues at all, and it really was like she had completely vanished without a trace. She just disappeared off the face of the earth. There was no information, there was no financial information. She hadn't accessed her bank account. She wasn't calling her friends. Essentially, Vitalia's footprint on life had just stopped. The common theme throughout the whole time was this concern with the ex-husband, but I still had no evidence to say that anybody had seen him in the country any time at the time that she was reported missing. Um, it was just really unusual, and it really was like she just completely vanished. There was absolutely no trace of her. 48 hours after her disappearance, and there was still no sign of Vitalia. For two days, the police had been working tirelessly, sourcing and examining local CCTV footage, interviewing Vitalia's friends and family, and analysing phone records. And it was those phone records that gave detectives their first breakthrough by calling into question a key fact. Despite the fact that Romantis had told us that he had not been in the UK since February, we investigated his mobile phone, which showed, in fact, that on Thursday the 11th, he received a text message somewhere in the region of Dover, and that was likely to be a welcome to the UK text message. Romantas Balatovicius claimed he had not been to the UK for six months, but his phone records implied otherwise. If he'd lied and actually entered the UK just hours before Vitalia vanished, there should also be a record of his ferry crossing. So then we'd look at what the arrival time was of that ferry and look at the manifest and see who'd come in and look at all the names of the vehicles were on that. But at no time did we find Romantas Balatovicius on any of the passenger manifests. Romantas Balatovicius could not enter the UK. He knew he would be stopped and arrested at customs because he was wanted for common assault. Yet his mobile phone was telling a different story. So we started to refine the types of names. We were looking for other uh, Eastern European sounding names to then try and identify from passport images whether or not he had come into the UK under a different identity 
and we very quickly narrowed that list of names down to just a handful, but one completely stood out from the rest, and that was the identity of a man called Rimas Ven Clovis, who, when we compared the image on his identity card, looked strikingly similar to the man that we knew as Rimantus Baliutovicius. Vitalia's ex-husband had lied to the police. He had legally changed his name to Rimas Ven Clovis, and arrived in the UK the evening before Vitalia disappeared. With his new name, the passenger manifest also provided the registration to his vehicle, a Mercedes Vito van. The police set about tracking its journey once it entered the UK. We were able to show through automatic number plate recognition cameras that the vehicle had crossed the bridge at Dartford and had then worked its way all the way up to Cambridgeshire and indeed was within a few hundred yards of Vitalia's home after midnight and was clearly in the vicinity when Vitalia would leave for work just a few hours later. Romantas had gone to great lengths to drive to Vitalia's house undetected. The police knew he was already back in Lithuania, but they had no idea where his ex-wife was. This was a crime in action now. We believe Vitalia has been kidnapped, but we were never ever gonna lose sight of the fact that we could get Vitalia back. On the 16th of August, 2011, four days after Vitalia had last been seen, a chilling image was discovered by the officers who had been trawling the hours of local CCTV footage, an image that reinforced the detective's worst fears. When I saw that CCTV, I felt that in the pit of my stomach because for the first time, we had some clear steer as to what had gone on here. And it clearly showed the footage of a woman that looked quite a lot like Vitalia being grabbed from behind by somebody that looked a lot like Romantus Baliutovicius. This is not gonna end well, really. He's with her, and if he's with her, this is not good for her. Because we, you could tell from the statements and from the build-up of the picture we had from family and friends that him being anywhere near her was not gonna be a good thing. The glimpses of Vitalia on CCTV confirmed once and for all that she had been snatched by her violent and obsessive ex-husband. But it didn't reveal what happened once her assailant dragged her beyond the frame of the camera. For me, my thought processes around what had happened to her were that she'd been kidnapped and that he had control over her and that she was still alive, or that the worst case scenario had occurred and actually he had done what he'd been threatening to do for a number of years in their marriage and that was to kill her and bury her. Twenty-nine-year-old Vitalia Balatovicien was reported missing on the 12th of August 2011. It was suspected that her violently abusive ex-husband Romantas had had a hand in her disappearance. He had travelled from Lithuania to the UK under an alias the night before she vanished. The police's worst fears were confirmed four days after Vitalia went missing, when they uncovered CCTV footage that captured Romantas abducting his ex-wife. This was now a hunt for Vitalia, but a hunt for him, uh, and to try and determine just how much damage he has done. For a decade, Vitalia had been subjected to the most horrific physical and mental abuse at the hands of Romantas. He would regularly beat her, hold her by the throat and threaten to kill and bury her. The police knew he had taken Vitalia, but now they needed to uncover what he had done once he had abducted her. I needed some clarity about what took place in that road, so I acquired a dog handler, and the dog followed the route that we knew Vitalia had taken on CCTV, hugging the wall on the left-hand side of the road all the way to the end, and the dog stopped at the only reasonable place that that van could have parked up waiting for Vitalia. So I was very, very clear in my mind at that point that the van had been used to carry Vitalia away from that scene. At 5.20 on the Friday morning, I know that Vitalia was taken. Hello, Vitalia. Dragged into Thistlemore Road in Peterborough by Romantis. 58 minutes later, we see the van that Romantis brought into the UK, driving back along Thistlemore Road. 
Vitalia had been a prisoner in her violent ex-husband's van for almost an hour before it was captured on CCTV as it left the area. The police had no idea what Dramantas had done to Vitalia in that time, or where he had taken her. So the challenge was to map the route that that vehicle took when it turned left out of Thistlemore Road in Peterborough. And there was a huge array of CCTV to try and trawl through and to try and find sightings of him. Um, and we spread that net quite wide. By piecing together the glimpses of the van on CCTV, the police tracked the vehicle carrying Vitalia beyond Peterborough and out into the Cambridgeshire countryside. But then the CCTV runs dry towards the Fenland area of Cambridge here, which is vast, open agricultural land with ditches and areas of forestation. It would be appealing if you wanted to hide a body and stand a good chance of it not being found. The same CCTV camera captured the van returning to Peterborough an hour later. Detectives were faced with the reality that Romantas had not just kidnapped his ex-wife, but also murdered her. To drive out to that remote location and then within an hour drive back again, that for me suggested that he was going there to deposit Vitalia's body. The analogy a needle in a haystack is as real as it's probably ever going to be in, in these sorts of circumstances. There is water in drains, open farmland, forested areas with really dense undergrowth, all of which present different challenges in trying to find somebody who's either dead or alive but incapacitated. Whilst the police believed Vitalia was hidden somewhere in the vast Cambridgeshire countryside and began their search to uncover her, they knew exactly where her abductor and possible killer was located. I secured a European arrest warrant to formally arrest uh, Romantis in Lithuania and sent a team out to Lithuania with a view to getting him arrested as quickly as possible so that vital evidence could be recovered which might give us some idea of where Vitalia was. The officers in Lithuania were able to tell me through working with the local police that he was trying to sell the distinctive Mercedes van. So in order to secure him and the van, we posed as customers and he was arrested on suspicion of the murder and kidnap of Vitalia. Romantas Balatovicius was arrested two weeks after Vitalia's abduction. Now in Lithuanian custody, his home was searched and belongings secured in the hope they would offer the key to locating her. Back in the UK, the hope of finding Vitalia alive had all but extinguished, but the intensive search for her body continued. Those searches went on for weeks and weeks. Every effort um, that we possibly could that was reasonable, we used to try and find Vitalia's body but she was nowhere to be found. Will we ever find her? Will we ever find her? And I think it's important for her family, and especially her son, for her to be found, because they need that closure, don't they? One way or the other, they need that closure. Two months after Romantas abducted his ex-wife from the street, the 47-year-old Lithuanian was finally brought to the UK to stand trial. Romantas was eventually extradited uh, from Lithuania, um, and officers transferred him back into the UK, and he was formally charged with the murder and kidnap of Vitalia. With Vitalia still missing and presumed dead, the police faced going to trial without knowing what Romantas had done to her and where he had hidden her body. One of the massive restrictions when dealing with European arrest warrants is that you lose the right to interview somebody. And I went against the guidance, and I asked two of my officers to interview him OK, Romantis. But ask him one question, where, where is Vitalia? He refused to help. What have you done with her? Romantis would not respond to the one question the police and his own son needed answering. However, his demeanour noticeably changed when officers mentioned to him the belongings they had secured from his home in Lithuania. We've got your wallet and we've got your sat -nav. 
he hadn't acknowledged the fact that we'd got his mobile phone, hadn't acknowledged the fact that we'd got his credit cards and bank cards, but as soon as he was aware that we had got his sat-nav, the colour drained out of his face. Romantas Balatovicius's reaction to the mention of his sat-nav led the police to believe it could hold the key to where Vitalia was hidden. The sat-nav is constantly recording point data, and Romantas' sat-nav had all of this data collected for the last six months. His full journey from Lithuania to Peterborough was there, and the return journey as well, but also the missing time was filled in of his route around Peterborough that led us to believe that we might be able to locate Vitalia's body. For months, the police had been tirelessly searching the Cambridgeshire countryside, but had not found one clue to help pinpoint Vitalia's location. But with Romantis' sat-nav, it was almost as if detectives were sat with him in his van for every mile of his ominous journey. We were particularly focusing on the route after Vitalia had been abducted. We found that route went all the way to a village in the Fens called Upwood. As we studied the route from Peterborough to Upwood, we could see that as it was passing wooded areas, the vehicle was slowing down. The critical data from the sat-nav showed that he was parked under a, an oak tree in a field adjacent to a forest for somewhere in the region of eight or nine minutes. And it was at that point we were fairly confident that we may have found Vitalia's grave. It seemed the sat-nav pinpointed the exact location Romantas had dumped his ex-wife's body. We had dogs in there, I had search team officers in there in real number looking for Vitalia. Ready? Now, I even had officers piggybacking other officers to see how far you could get into that forest carrying a body. But she was nowhere to be found. The police had been convinced Vitalia's body lay in the Cambridge Fens, and they had spent months searching for her grave. But detectives were beginning to realise that she wasn't there. In fact, she may not be in the UK at all. Could Romantas have smuggled his ex-wife's body abroad? It was a extremely risky move. We couldn't conceive that he would have done that, which is why we focused all our inquiries initially into the UK, until we'd really explored every avenue of that and concluded that we've looked everywhere that he's been and she's not there. I had to countenance the fact that actually, he, against all the odds, he'd been brave enough to take her out of the UK. The police were now faced with the daunting prospect that Romantas had hidden his ex-wife in his van and buried her somewhere on the European mainland. I mean, from Dunkirk to his home, it was about 1160 miles that he'd driven to get back home. So she could have been somewhere on that way. So we then knew we had quite a task on our hands to find uh, where he might have dumped her. Now police believed Vitalia was hidden in Europe, they were uncertain as to whether her body would ever be found. But while Romantas was on remand awaiting trial, a witness came forward from the most unlikely of places. Just before Christmas, a man was released from prison that had been on remand with Van Clovis, and the two had been conversing. And he'd told him something along the lines of that they would never find her. They never find her. But she was buried near a railway track, but near water. Romantas Balatovicius had bragged openly about killing his ex-wife and disposing of her body. For the first time, detectives had some sort of description of the area where Vitalia lay. They once again turned to the sat-nav and virtually joined Romantas on his journey to dispose of the 29-year-old's body. What it showed is that he'd been driving along and he'd been driving quite steadily and normally with just these few stops in these garages and laybys. But his driving pattern changed once he got into Poland. He then arrived at this area called Little Suchi. There was a dirt track into a woods and he didn't hesitate, he drove straight into this dirt track. Drove along it for about 400 metres and then the vehicle stopped. Romantas Balatovicius had driven into a deserted Polish wood in the dead of night, and the sat-nav told the police just how long he stayed in the forest. 
he was probably stopped in that wood for about 40 minutes, which was enough time to dispose of a body. After months of searching, the police believed this time Romantis's Satnav had guided them to the correct location of Vitalia's grave. When I learned of that fact, I was really upbeat that, that actually the, the search for Vitali was, was about to come to an end. Earlier in the investigation, the police had issued details about Vitalia across Europe, and there had been no results. Now, the coordinates of the Satnav were given to Poland via Interpol in January 2012, with a request to search the location for a hidden grave. But a month after the Satnav data had been sent, there was still no word. It seemed Vitalia had vanished, and the police began to accept they would never find her. By February, this investigation had been running for six months, and we still had not found Vitalia. Eventually, you have to kind of start to get your head around the fact that whatever you try, you're never going to find her. And that search had to stop somewhere. In time, it would have had to have stopped. We thought we were going to go to trial um, without a body. The police had a strong case against Romantas Balatovicius, but in any murder investigation, the body is the most significant piece of evidence. There was no way to delay the trial, and tragically, Vitalia's body appeared to be lost forever. But little did the police know, back in October 2011, a mushroom picker had found a body near the location revealed by Romantis's Satnav. It was the body of a female with blonde hair, found two months after Vitalia was taken. In February 2012, just two weeks before the trial, the Cambridgeshire police received word from Poland telling them about the unidentified female body they'd uncovered four months earlier. It just had to be Vitalia. At dawn on the 12th of August 2011, 29-year-old Vitalia Balatovicien had been abducted by her obsessively jealous and violent ex-husband. The police believed Romantas had murdered the mother of his son, but by February 2012, it seemed that they would never find her grave or truly know what had happened to her. Detectives had analyzed Romantis's satnav, which had told them the exact movements of the heartless killer after the abduction. It took them to a remote forest in Poland. Initially, it seemed Vitalia wasn't there, but in February 2012, just two weeks before the trial, word reached Cambridgeshire that a body had been found in that forest. Back in October in 2011, so about 10 weeks after Vitalia was taken, a mushroom picker stumbled across uh, things sticking out of the ground. And very quickly, it was established that it was the body of a female. She'd been in the ground for a number of weeks, and Polish police were running a murder investigation, and they concluded that she'd been violently strangled. The body of the naked woman in the woods was discovered on the 30th of October 2011 and at the time was believed to be a murdered prostitute who disappeared from the local area. The decomposing body had been in the ground for about 10 weeks, which tallied with Vitalia's disappearance. But at the time of its discovery, the Polish police did not make the connection between the body and the missing 29-year-old. For some reason, they never identified her, they never informed us and they never matched her DNA. Now, we don't know why that was. Hi, I'm calling from the Cambridge... We'd requested all of the countries that he'd passed through that should they find any unidentified female bodies, that we'd be informed about it. We also supplied these countries with Vitalia's DNA. But it would appear that something had gone wrong. The location of the body fitted with the information detectives had retrieved from Romantis's satnav. When Cambridgeshire Police contacted the Polish authorities via Interpol in January 2012, the Polish police realised the potential connection with the female body they'd found in the forest months before. 
We went back to all the countries and we gave them a list of all the stops that the sat-nav had identified as one last chance to say, this is everywhere we believe this guy stopped. And then we got an email to say, one of those areas that you've highlighted in the wood in Little Suchi, we actually found a body in there many months ago. They revisited the DNA of the body they found and found then that it matched with Vitalia. Six months after her abduction, the police finally understood what had become of Vitalia. Her body had been the missing piece of the puzzle, and with that now found, Romantas Balatovicius stood trial for the kidnap and murder of his ex-wife. The trial began on the 2nd of October 2012 at the Old Bailey in London. Romantas, who had changed his name to Remes van Clovis, pleaded not guilty. I think he thought he was going to get away with her murder. I think he actually thought he should get away with her murder. Um, and I'm sure to this day he actually feels that he's been the victim in all of this. The prosecution presented compelling evidence to prove how the obsessively jealous and violent Romantis had plotted to kidnap and murder his former wife and the mother of his 10-year-old son. He had planned this for a number of weeks. And he knew that with his new identity, he could safely get to Peterborough and stay under the police radar, go undetected. Now legally named Rimas van Clovis, Romantas Balatovicius tested this theory with a trial run a month before he abducted and killed his ex-wife. It appeared Romantas decided to kidnap and murder Vitalia because he was bitterly jealous of her new relationship. The revelation that Vitalia had a boyfriend, that he had bought her a silver necklace that she'd moved on, that kicked off a chain of events that would see him buy a van, black out the windows, a sat-nav journey recorded that brings him all the way to Peterborough, and he's waiting outside her door. He abducted her on the corner as she went to work, dragged her into his van. She was probably very well aware of what was going to happen to her because she'd been reminded of it throughout her marriage, that it was his destiny to kill her. He would have terrified her. She would have known what was going to happen. Romantis was captured on CCTV, dragging his ex-wife to his parked van just after 5 a.m. Almost an hour later, the van emerged from the street. Vitalia was almost certainly already dead. He then drove into the remote area of, of Cambridgeshire, where he attempted to dispose of her body, found that there was too many people around or he couldn't find a nice spot. Unable to dispose of her in the UK, Romantis hid Vitalia's body in his van, headed for Dover, and bought a ferry ticket to Dunkirk in France. And then he drove her all the way across Europe, 900 miles, and he then buried her in a field in a remote part of Poland. And in doing that, put her family through hell and deprived their son of a mother for the rest of his life. That's the sort of man that Remus van Clovis is. The compelling evidence was supported by one key irrefutable source. Satnav ended up being really the foundation that all the other evidence was pinned against, really. It's like a technical fingerprint or DNA. There's just no argument about it. It, it. It's it's there in black and white. It's right. It said it was at a location at a certain time. There's no arguing that. There's, there's no way around that. The jury was left in no doubt about what had tragically happened to Vitalia. The jury took two hours to convict him. The case was always strong, and he knew that, but he fought all the way. He lied all the way. He played the system all the way. He put the family through hell all the way. Just as he showed no emotion buying tickets to get on a ferry to go home after he's just killed his wife, he showed no emotion that he'd just been found guilty of it. And that's the true testament of the person that he is. The emotion is missing in him. The man who for a decade had violently abused the mother of his own son was sentenced to life imprisonment to serve a minimum of 20 years. Vitalia tried to separate her, her, her life from one of domestic violence with Romantas. But it was his jealousy, his obsession and his compulsion that would stop her from being happy. It's absolutely critical 
that people who are the subject of domestic violence do not endure it, do not let it go on in secret. The police will support you. You have to tell us that it's happening. On average, two women are killed in the UK every week by a male partner or ex-partner. Romantis is now in prison, and his son, who lives with Vitalia's surviving family, has to come to terms with the reality that his mother has gone forever. The lasting victim now is her son. He's effectively orphaned. The family are looking after him, I believe. But, you know, he, he had his parents taken away from him. And will he ever get over it? I don't know. I think the whole thing's a tragedy. 